Palitzo's The Writing Life. I'm Sandra Beasley, and our guest today is Marie Howe. Marie Howe is the author of three poetry collections, The Good Thief, What the Living Do, and her latest book, The Kingdom of Ordinary Time. She teaches at Sarah Lawrence College and lives in New York City. And from 2012 to 2014, she was the Poet Laureate of New York State. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm happy to be here. Great. I want to start by mentioning two muses or key impulses that always come to mind when I think about your work. One is music and the other is prayer. Hmm. And I feel like, uh, of course, many poets flirt with these, these impulses, these mechanisms, but your work more than anyone else's. So can you tell me a little bit about how you feel uh, in, in relationship to music and prayer in your poems? Well, hmm. Um, I love, hmm. I, my mind's going in three different directions. Let me try to maybe speak to each of them. I grew up uh, going to mass. Hmm. And uh, the musicality of that ritual is a big part of me. Um, the musicality of the old, what we Christians call the Old Testament or the Torah, um, and the musicality of the New Testament, the parables. Mm -hmm. um, and the parables really bring up the musicality of conversational speech, mm -hmm. which I love. Um, like Robert Frost, um, I love the way the sound of people talking with each other as well. So all that combined, I think, makes up um, the kind of musicality I hear when a poem comes through. It's interesting that you mention that, the musicality of everyday speech mm. or dialogue. Mm. It makes me think of a number of poems that are in What the Living Do, mm -hmm. where you transcribe or recreate or construct mm -hmm. uh, conversations of intimacy. Uh, I wonder, there's, a, there's one of my favorite poems, and you may have a choice of your own. Uh, there's a number of poems where you're in conversation with, your, with the speaker's brother, John. Yes. Um, I wonder if you might pick one of those that weaves in that dialogue. Well, John, you know, is was one of my younger brothers and he died at uh, 28 years old after living with the AIDS virus for several years. It was in the 80s when people died and um, he was my dear, dear friend and um, really my editor or first editor and spiritual teacher in many, many ways. Um, let me read The Gate, yeah. which is a, a poem uh, that had John and I, John talking. The gate. I had no idea that the gate I would step through to finally enter this world would be the space my brother's body made. He was taller than me, a young man but grown, himself by then, done at 28, having folded every sheet and rinsed every glass he would ever rinse under the cold and running water. This is what you have been waiting for, he used to say to me. And I would say, what? And he would say, this, holding up my cheese and mustard sandwich. And I would say, what? And he would say, this, sort of looking around. <laughs> I was reading that poem at 6 a.m. this morning for what oh, yeah. might have been the 30th time. Yeah. Um, and you have taken that kind of natural conversation, uh, that natural sense of musicality, and I feel like in The, the Kingdom of Ordinary Time, your, your more recent book, in some places uh, it's a little more heightened, it's a little more uh, formal. There's a play with character perhaps outside the intimate sphere, more in the realm of persona. And I'm thinking in particular of the, the Life of Mary poems. Oh yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about the genesis of that series 
And, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I, when I look at the length of the lines and the count of the lines, I'm wondering if there's the ghosts of some sonnets hiding behind those poems. Sandra, you're so smart. You're so interesting. <laughs> um, well, I grew up, again, with these stories. And these, although I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, I love these stories. These were the, this is the mythology of my early life. And um, I don't mean that it's not true, but I mean that they serve as archetypes for me. Mary, Joseph, Moses, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, all these wonderful characters. Um, the Jewish tradition, of course, has the tradition of Midrash, mm. where the Torah is constantly being written. And one applies one's imagination into the spaces between utterances, in the silences of these stories, and um, begins to imagine within those silences. Um, when I was a kid, I was the oldest girl of nine children, and we would put on these Christmas plays every Christmas. I would force everybody into them. And um, so I was always working with these figures. And um, they were ridiculous little plays. Nothing, they were ridiculous. But the Mary, uh, as a woman person, um, not Mary the Virgin, which we know, of course, mm. some of us believe is something created from the early church fathers, but Mary the person, Meister Eckhart, the great 14th century theologian, said something wonderful about Mary. He said, perhaps Jesus is the fruit of Mary's enlightenment. Hmm. Perhaps Jesus is the fruit of Mary's enlightenment. Hmm. A remarkable thing to say. Yeah. And the other thing he said is each of us can become the mother of God. Um, and I think that that really is part of what was happening in this book where Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is within you. Mary in th this series is a young woman who is not a mother, not a wife, um, but a woman who is bewildered uh, searching for something, and sometimes she thinks she sees it. Mm. So I'll read um, that poem. And they were uh, 14, there are 14 line poems, or they were originally 14 line poems. And um, they were even rhymed in the mm. beginning. Some of them still hold that ghost. Yeah. Once or twice, or three times I saw something rise from the dust in the yard like the soul of the dust or from the field, the soul body of the field, rise and hover like a veil in the sun billowing as if I could see the wind itself. I thought I did it, but I didn't as if the edges of things blurred, so what was in bled out, breathed up and mingled, bush and cow, dust and well, breathed a field I walked through as through high grass or water, my fingers swirling through it, or it through me. I saw it. It was thing and spirit, both. The real world, Evident, invisible. Hmm. One of the things that I so admire about your work is the way it can choreograph perception in real time in a way that makes the poems feel very organic, feel very kind of spontaneous, and yet you're such a craftswoman and, and you see that level of not strategy, because that might be a, a kind of cold world, word, but you see that thoughtfulness when you lift back and look at the way that you organize and arrange your manuscripts. Hmm. Uh, I'm fascinated, for example, by the fact that in What the Living Do, in some ways, the hub is, uh, is John's death, but you don't put that at the end of the collection, because in, in that sense, then the whole book would be building up towards the dying, when as the title tells us, what it really is about is the living, right? And so you, you slip 
the poem, I believe the line is something like, and he took the morphine and he died a week later. Uh, it, it comes in so uh, elegantly and unexpectedly halfway through. Did you think about that? Did you move the poems around through a, a variety of positions or? Forgive me while I fall down laughing. I mean, <laughs> putting the book together is such agony for me. <laughs> agony. Um, John's death was a very minor part of this mm -hmm. book. Um, John's life was the major part. Um, what he said and did and how he lived in those last years was such an instruction to me. And he was so full of joy um, and life um, that that's what I wanted to, to bring into the book. Of course he died. We all die. <laughs> um, I'm going to die. You're going to die. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, his dying uh, was very minor um, in terms of what I wanted to celebrate in the book. So it's not only uh, m living on. Everybody, everybody who's listening to us now has probably already lived through irreparable loss. Mm -hmm. um, and then you become the person who lives on. The great thing, of course, is that then we contain the beloved, yeah. and the beloved stays with us all the time. What the Living Do, which is the title poem of this book, which is written as a letter to John years later, um, was going to be the ending. And I realized it couldn't be. The ending ending had to be Buddy, which is about a dog <laughs> and the dog's vitality. Yeah. And even, I'd love to read Buddy. I would love to hear you read because it. Because I haven't read it in a long time. And it always makes me happy. I love dogs. I have a dog at home right now. His name is Jack. Um, and this Buddy, um, well, Buddy. Andy sees us to the door and Buddy is suddenly all over him, leaping and barking because Andy said walk. Are you going to walk home? He said to me. And Buddy thinks him and now and he's wrong. He doesn't understand the difference between sign and symbol like we do. The thing and the word for the thing. How we can talk about something when it's not even there, without it actually happening. The way I talk about John. Andy meant soon. He meant me. As for Buddy, Andy meant later. When he was good and ready, he said. Buddy doesn't understand. He's in a state of agitation and grief, scratching at the door. If one of us said Andy, when Andy wasn't there, that silly buddy would probably jump up barking and begin looking for him. It's so fun, not only the vitality of that poem, but the humor. And, uh, and I think that in the kingdom of ordinary time, you're able to bring in, in some cases, the perceptions or the, the mind logic of children in a way. It's done with a light touch, and there's humor there. Uh, but it's not, it's not pandering, and it's not mocking the kids for naivete. It's more respecting the fact that they, in their own way, have some insights into the world that perhaps we've forgotten, unfortunately, and the chance to rediscover them through the poems. Oh, absolutely. I mean. You know, I adopted my daughter, and I spent suddenly in my 50s a lot of time in playgrounds. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's all international politics there. <laughs> I mean, the whole world is happening in a playground, writ small, but it's the same exact issues. You know, who, who goes first, who goes second, what's fair, who owns what, who's playing where, are you allowed? to enter that person's territory and not enter that person's territory. And um, I'm, I'm always very moved by, by what children have to say. Pretty much in all the poems where kids show up, they show up wiser than the speaker. <laughs>
<laughs> of the poems. Do yeah. you do you foresee? Uh, I, attended a panel years ago that was a discussion of, of citing one's children in, in one's work. It was Gregory Orr and Aaron Ballou and some other poets. Do you foresee a, a moment at which you feel less comfortable pulling from the material of the real world as, as a child grows older? Or is that door kind of always open? That's a really good question. I think that there are some things I wouldn't publish mm -hmm. that I have written. Um, I've tried to write prose. Um, essays, and I have written them, but I don't think I would publish them now. Yeah. My daughter's 16. Yeah. I don't know that she wants those stories told about her um, <laughs> in the public world, and I think she should be able to read them before uh, they're published. And so I'm just putting the whole thing off for a few years. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's difficult to be written about when you're not the writer. Absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned essays, though, because you did uh, co-edit with Michael Klein an mm -hmm. anthology of essays uh, in the company of my solitude. And can you just speak briefly? I mean, we've already uh, kind of bumped up against the, the mm -hmm. theme of the AIDS epidemic and all the people we lost, but how that anthology came about and, mm -hmm. and working in prose as well as poetry. Well, it was in the 80s um, when, you know, people were still terribly discriminated against and people were still afraid of the AIDS virus. Um, thought of it as a sort of social disease or um, that was, uh, you know. So there was that. Johnny had just died. And I met Michael Klein. And Michael Klein not only is a great and magnificent poet, there's nobody sounds like him in the whole world, but he uh, was an activist. He had, he had written, a, put together an anthology called Poets for Life. Mm. And the first time I ever heard Michael or Mark Doty was at a reading these Poets for Life gave in Cambridge in 1989, hmm. long time ago now. And there was Michael Klein, Mark Doty, and several other poets, um, all of whom moved me so much. And for the first time, I saw that you could write right into this pandemic hmm. and what was happening um, in people's lives because of it. So Michael and I spoke, and he said, let's put together uh, some essays. And I had never edited anything before, maybe a plowshares or this or that, but I said, okay, let's do it. And we, we sent out uh, the word, uh, the way you do. And I'm proud to say Mark Doty's first prose essay was published oh. in our, um, in the company Goodness. of my solitude, mm -hmm. a beautiful, beautiful piece. So many people wrote beautiful pieces who then went on to write nonfiction books. But we also reached out to sex workers mm -hmm. and to women who were infected and to um, mothers. Um, and it was, it was a, great, a great thing to do. Um, it's still around and I, I'm really happy uh, to have done it with Michael. Well, and I'm so glad to hear you talk about it because in a, in a conversation under the aegis of the writing life. I think mm -hmm. it's so important to acknowledge that it's not just always about a dialogue between us and the page, but being no. part of a larger community. Um, now you, uh, again, were able to kind of re-enter the, the realm of, of advocacy when you were serving as Poet Laureate. Uh, and, I, and I know that you, there were a few initiatives that you got yeah. very involved with. I'd love to hear you talk more about ways in which you were able to kind of bring poetry into public settings. Well, I was so excited because I feel like poetry, um, everybody really wants a poem. Um, when someone dies, when someone gets married, when someone has a baby, when someone falls in love, the huge portals of our life we walk through and we want to bring a poem with us. Funerals, uh, you know, we really do. And a lot of people don't know where to go or what to do. And they feel it's sort of beyond them. Well, I very much believe that poetry is the human uh, art and that we've been doing it from the beginning of our existence on the planet, when we were around the fires together, when we were singing lullabies to our children. Um, nobody had to go to school to learn how to make a poem. <laughs> nobody had to, uh, you didn't have to, it was part of our song. Um, so we did a number of things. The best thing that happened to me was I approached the MTA mm -hmm. um, in New York. I was lucky to meet Sandra Bloodworth, who is the director of the MTA, that's the Metropolitan Transit Authority's um, art and design program, the 
stuff that happens, musicians in the subways and different places. Um, and I asked her if we could work together. She said she was love to, love to, but she was so overwhelmed. She couldn't even talk to me for a while. And then, of course, they do, um, what's it called, Poetry in Motion mm -hmm. with the Poetry Society of America, Alice Quinn and her whole crew. Anyway, I said, can I just come talk to you? I went and talked to Sandra. I told her my dream. She said, OK, we'll have to do it. <laughs> and we, we did a two-day poetry sort of spectacular at Grand Central Terminal where we had um, poems on the, projected onto the walls that it would all fall down. We had um, poetry booths. I did a class at NYU with a technical people who created these amazing technological poetry booths. But the coolest thing we did that we then took on the, took on the next year, we moved it and did it. We, we, we did a thing called the Poet is In. Yeah. And I created this long ago at my daughter's school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you laughed because it's like Linus, right? The yeah, doctor it's is right in. out of Charlie Brown. So we made a booth at her school, and I sat behind it, and I had a typewriter. Well, I'll tell you what we did in Grand Central Terminal. We had a, a, a desk, a typewriter, carbon paper, a bell, a stamp that said original, and a three-minute egg timer. Oh, a rug, a lamp. So it was a domestic, like this, a domesticated yeah. space. <laughs> and another chair pulled up to the desk. And people were invited to come and have a poem written for them. And we put an award-winning poet, like yourself, at that desk. Within minutes, the line was two and a half hours long. Oh, my goodness. Two wow. and a half hours. <laughs> we got another, another desk, another lamp, another rug, another poet. By the end of the first day, we had three poets, three desks, three. Wow. Still, the line, the line was about a, an hour and a half long. That's great. People sat down and said, will you write a poem that will bring my wife back to me? <laughs> People sat down and, with a baby and said, will you write a poem for her? Wow. The next year, at the Fulton, new Fulton Street Subway Center, which is very fancy in New York, we had six poets, six hours, changing every hour, typewriters, carbon paper. Uh -huh. and so the line was still over an hour long with all those poets, all kinds of people. Yeah. Well, what a great model for what a poet laureate can do in terms of uh, reminding a community that poetry can be a vibrant, fun part of the, you know, the, the life and doesn't necessarily. It was so moving, Sandra. Yeah. People would come, and different poets did different things. They would ask questions. My friend Donna Messini would say, I have a door here. You can't see beyond it. There's something behind it. Do you want me to open it? Hmm. Some people would say no. Some would say yeah. And she would say, what do you want to be behind this door? And the person might say, my daughter who died at eight, hmm. or my grandmother's chair, or that shawl I lost in college that I've never been able to find. Hmm. And then their words, the poet would take their words and transform them and type something up, pull it out, sign it, and then they would put the copy in here and then they would read the poem to the person yeah. and give it to them. And so everybody wept. We're capturing the snapshot of poetry as it is right now, and so I'm going uh, to cruelly telescope and, and ask you briefly, I, I know that you you got your MFA uh, in 1983 from Columbia, so let's picture you know, that telescope between 1983 and, and now, um, more, than, more than a few years. And what do you see as some of the sh main shifts that have taken place in poetry as a culture or in the MFA culture that's uh, so often attached to poetry? Well, first of all, there's just more poetry in the world right now, mm -hmm. Yahoo. Um, mm -hmm. it just. There just is. Including Grand Central. <laughs> yeah. I want there to be a permanent installation there. I'll just put in a word for that. Um, I think there ought to be a permanent installation of the Poet is in at Grand Central Terminal. Um, but um, poetry, when I was in graduate school, Sandra, in 1981, it was the year uh, just after Sharon Olds had written her first book. Lucille mm. Clifton had just written her first book. Um, 
We were not taught very many women at all, too, usually, in the course of the time I was there. It was very male-dominated, very white male-dominated. And it was right at the moment when women were about to shove their way into the room, <laughs> thank God. And Adrienne Rich and mm. Rio Rockheiser and Sharon Olds and Lucille Clifton and Audrey Lord and all these women were going to begin to sing. Mm. And um, it was extraordinary. All the people from the margins were going to come in. You know, queer voices, Latino voices, African American voices, every, you know, Asian voices were going to come in to the room. Yeah. So this is thrilling about now. The thing that's not thrilling to me, and this is happening to the whole culture, is that people, when we went, when I was at graduate school in 1981, there was, uh, how do I say this? Somebody mentioned it today, the word vocation. <laughs> um, yeah. That poetry was a vocation. It was yeah. never going to be a career. Mm -hmm. I already taught high school. That's all I knew how to do. Yeah. Um, teaching's not writing. So, mm -hmm. But now, unfortunately, in, a, in the America, United States of America, Consumerism has come to such a pitch that I think that the MFA programs have been infected by the spirit of consumerism. Mm -hmm. So that people think that they can buy something. Not everybody at all. But there is this sense of um, wanting to, to purchase something mm -hmm. um, that isn't purchasable. Poetry is the most uncapitalistic un <laughs> uh, endeavor. Yeah. endeavor, a poem is worth nothing in the uh, uh, exchange of capital. Nothing. We want people to steal our poems. <laughs> we want them to learn them by heart, yeah. carry them away. We want them to copy them and give them to their friends, right? Yeah. We, we, there's, no, there's no money in it. Um, we, it's the gift economy, really, what Lewis Hyde wrote so beautifully about years ago in that great book, The Gift. Yeah. Um, so there's something wonderful about everybody in the room, and there's also a little bit of a feeling of um, uh, what, you know, what are you going to give me? Well, we, I mean, it, it's so great to think that we now have uh, teachers like you moving through the world and influence, influencing so many through your work, through your words, um, some of which we've gotten to hear today. Uh, I just want to ask one very brief question, and unfortunately our time has drawn to a close. Uh, can you give us a sense of, of what might be coming from you next? Is there something forthcoming or future that you're working on? I, yes. I'm, I'm nervous to say, but I've I'm just finished a book. It's called Magdalene, and it's sort of in the voice of Mary Magdalene. Um, but she's a very contemporary um, Magdalene, and it's coming out from Norton next winter. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Marie Howe, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for joining us today on this edition of Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. <laughs>